Model engineering boilers have been a topic of hot debate from as far back as the legendary battle of the boilers between Greenlee and LBSC. I can see no end to this ongoing saga, and rightly so. As ideas, regulations and manufacturing techniques change, so should the methods of design and construction. I personally fiercely contest any draconian regulation, nor will I ever be bold enough to insist on specific boiler manufacturing techniques being imposed on fellow model engineers. I have far too much admiration and respect for anyone capable of making a live steam, well, anything. The following is simply a video on my methods of boiler construction, with reference where applicable to the model engineering codes I currently have at my disposal. Having said that, some regulation is necessary, if only to give the paper pushers, the armchair engineers and bureau rats something to do. If a builder is to use their boiler in a public space, they need to be aware of the rules and regulations specific to that region. The local club boiler inspector is the proverbial gatekeeper, but more often than not, he has a wealth of information and advice. All of the model engineering boiler codes require boilers to be submitted and test samples to be done before construction begins to the duly authorized club boiler inspector. I personally have a very good relationship with our boiler inspector. As all of my designs are new, I go through my calculations and manufacturing methods with them. I am always upfront with issues I have encountered during the design and construction and I value his input and advice. His advice is highly regarded amongst other model engineers as well, most likely due to the fact that he is a degreed engineer and has personally constructed numerous boilers, both copper and welded. The older designs for smaller gauges use copper and silver soldering techniques with each new boiler just implementing known plate sizes and stay ratios based on past experience. To take one of the older copper designs and simply swap out materials or methods of construction without doing the necessary calculation is foolish. And any club boiler inspector will stop that before construction. Of course, a brilliant boiler inspector will help you with the calculations and point you in the right direction without insisting you do it their way. Due to financial constraints and no intention to bankrupt myself with a hobby, most of my designs use TIG welding techniques instead of silver solder. This will be the predominant focus of the video series. The methods described are specific to the size of boiler I typically use on my builds. All methods are geared to decrease the cost of manufacture and, where possible, time. Completely new boiler designs can be a complex endeavor depending on the materials and methods of construction, with most of the examples used in the series, again, very specific to my boiler designs and builds. This is because they have been designed, made, tested, and are working models making these videos more than just an academic exercise. Hopefully the video series will show any model engineer hesitant to tackle TIG for boiler construction that it is a process relatively easy to master with a little practice and a basic understanding of the underlying principles. I hope the series will give both the builder and boiler inspectors some comfort in modern manufacturing techniques and their application by highlighting typical welding falls and pitfalls by means of examples. The hobby's infatuation with silver brazed copper for smaller live steam boilers has always fascinated me. For one, the cost of manufacturing a small copper boiler has become incredibly expensive. As not by any measure the most thermally efficient material, it tends to scale badly in operation, and manufacturing the boiler is difficult and dangerous. I would like to emphasize the dangerous part of that statement. Manufacturing a copper boiler requires the whole assembly to be heated to a minimum of 600 degrees C for silver brazing, or 400 degrees C for TIG welding. Then acid is used to remove the flux and scale, and the whole process is repeated a number of times before the job is done. Acid and temperatures well above that, what is required for serious burn injuries? What could possibly go wrong? I've made a number of copper boilers, and as careful as I am, I've earned a few blisters. 
Silver brazing is, in my opinion, far more difficult than just TIG welding a boiler. Then with normal use, copper is prone to sediment buildup and scaling, which thermally insulates the joints in the cold side, causing hot spots and possible failure, which incidentally would not be picked up during the static pressure tests because it's a compounding thermal failure mechanism. Another issue with copper is the higher thermal conductivity. This is actually counterintuitive, but convective heat transfer is most efficient just after the onset of nuclear boiling. The minute the bubbles get too large, this is when the heat transfer surface temperature passes a critical point, you'll have a drop off in the heat transfer coefficient and the heat flux decreases. Worst case, you get something called steam jacketing, where heat transfer is severely retarded as a direct result of the high copper conductivity. Availability of stainless steels has improved, and as a material, it costs a fraction of copper. Stainless steel laser cuts very easy and is much easier to TIG weld than copper. Some design changes and checks are required to manage the known issues, but once this has been done, it makes a very suitable small hobby boiler. It would be unreasonable to expect any boiler inspector to accept any design changes to an existing proven boiler design without accompanying practical tests or calculations. TIG welded copper boilers or a combination of TIG and silver soldered boilers is a simple method of decreasing the overall cost of a copper boiler by sparing the very costly silver solder. Standard welding calculations will help convince the boiler inspector the design strength has not been compromised, although if they have any experience with welding, I doubt even that would be necessary. You would need to submit welded examples and hopefully with this video and the sample bend test described later, you'll get the go-ahead. Changing the material of construction to a stainless steel boiler is a little trickier. Stainless steel is not covered by the UK Boiler Test Code due to, and I quote, specific requirements and difficulties. But this, is not, this does not mean it is not allowed. The code does give allowance for commercial boiler certification. This will inevitably require a full design write-up as well as all the regulatory requirements for pressure vessel welding design and fabrication, which is what we do for our boilers anyway. Unfortunately, there is very little in the way of design-specific advice for small boilers with even the Australian boiler code more suited for the larger boilers. For my designs, I've had to make extensive use of FEA, which is finite element analysis, and other thermal stress and surface potential calculations specific to the problems associated with stainless to design a safe working boiler. Nobody would argue the fact that the boiler should be viewed as a component in a larger system, including auxiliaries like the safety valves and blower. I have found through the thermal simulations and track testing of my stainless steel boilers that the design of the safety valves and blower is different to that of copper. Again, counterintuitively, the safety valve is slightly larger and the blower jet designed for less draft when compared to an equivalent copper boiler design. All of my stainless steel boilers have a design working pressure of 19 psi with a limit pressure of 100 psi. The boiler nozzle and safety valves need to be adjusted during the initial steam test if the limit pressure is exceeded with a good fire and the blower on full. Just a note here, using dissimilar construction materials with a rigid joining process like TIG is looking for problems. The finite element analysis says so. Nobody can deny that the overall differential thermal expansion varies in a boiler, including stresses and strains. This is marginal when compared to the massive localized thermal stresses induced by different coefficients of thermal expansion at a rigid connection. If one of the materials is ductile, it will just yield. But in the case of stainless, it is going to crack. The TIG welding process is described at infinitum on the interweb, but there is little information on using TIG for model engineering boiler manufacture. Before getting into the final minutiae, let's look at some pertinent points. Firstly, TIG is a clean welding process, with the quality of the weld prep one of the most important factors for a successful weld. 
There can't be any grease, oxides, or any other contamination in or around the weld. If I had a rain for every time I saw porosity in a carbon steel weld due to the welder not removing the mole scale, I'd be rich. Often stainless is left on the bench ready for the next weld run, only for the weld to be contaminated by grinding a piece of carbon steel on the same bench. On the topic of contamination, the correct filler rod is critical for a good weld, and that also should be clean and not covered in workshop grime and grease. You'll need a number of TIG welding consumables with TIG rod and cup sizes for my setup found in the article I wrote on model boiler construction me methods for the model engineer. And I'll put a reference in the, in the description below. The grinding of the electrode is important, but the point ground such that the grinding marks are in line with the rod. This is to make sure that the arc remains stable. The organ gas used in welding is a rental cylinder in my neck of the woods and is inexpensive. This most likely differs from region to region, but with a little planning and forethought, the cylinder can be leased and used only when needed if the cost is exorbitant. For both copper and stainless, a direct current electrode negative or DCEN configuration is used. This is the most common configuration and an entry level induction TIG welder with high frequency start can be bought for a reasonable price, probably less than a good brazing torch. An AC-DC high frequency pulse welder is beneficial when welding stainless because it decreases the heat input into the parent material and limits distortion. But it is very possible to get away without this luxury. As welding processes go, TIG welding is not very forgiving. This is actually a good thing because a bad looking weld is a bad weld, making visual inspection much, much easier. My personal view is that it can be mastered with a little patience and a lot of practice, and welding faults can be picked up very easily, making it perfect for the model engineer or amateur boiler maker and the club boiler inspector. This video was a general overview of the design and the material requirements for welding small model engineering boilers. In the next video, I'll go through the actual fabrication of one of these boilers in more detail. Till next time, thanks for watching guys.